So it's always nice to be on in the morning because you're awake. So at, least that, at least that's what I'm always told. Uh, my name is Matthew Griffin. Uh, I'm a, a futurist, but I'm also the founder and CEO of a global think tank called the 311 Institute. We go between the timelines of 2020 to 2070. Uh, the reason why we push beyond 2050 is because if you're working with sovereign governments like the G7, like the Middle East, if you're building a half a trillion dollar city like Mion in Saudi Arabia, you don't care so much about the next five years, you care about sort of longer term. So I've, I sort of get, ar <laughs> I get around, to be frank. Um, I work with companies like Area 2071 in Dubai, where we are literally building the Dubai of the future. So if you go to Dubai, anything that is future orientated has my fingerprints all over it. I work with the BBC, I work with Bentley, for example, as well as uh, Volkswagen, BMW, and the, and the Audi groups to help them uh, ideate kind of the next generations of cars. Uh, I work with uh, Centrica, so Centrica, I'm on the Technology and Innovation Committee where we are literally reinventing the company. Ernst & Young, Huawei, if any of you use Huawei or Samsung smartphones, I've helped design the next 20 years of those, so kind of the next five generations. And uh, when we talk about the future of smartphones, for example, because everyone always wants to know what comes after these things, the biggest issue moving from this format to the next format is getting rid of the screen. Because we can eliminate the compute and everything else, put it onto a button, but where are we going to stick, where are we going to stick the screen? Um, and then I work with a whole variety of different companies and, and bits and bobs, as well as organizations like Qualcomm, where we talk about the next 20 years of intelligent machines, semiconductors, and so on and so forth. Uh, and with one of these companies on here, we have built five generations of biological computers now. So within your business, you'll be talking about silicon-based computing, then be talking about quantum technologies and quantum computing. We're already starting to move beyond those. So that's me. What I want to try and do with this presentation, because I've got sort of ostensibly 30 minutes to really talk about life in 2030, which is a huge topic in itself and could probably accommodate a whole day. What I want to try and do is sort of demonstrate to you some of the drivers that will, some of the drivers of change, where they're coming from, how they're going to accelerate, how they're going to have an effect on your industry as well as every other industry on the planet. Um, so you can really sort of get a sense of why things are accelerating. So on the left-hand side, basically, we have organizations with an exponential culture. Uh, over the past five years, we've seen a tenfold growth in the number of newly registered startups in the world. There's now about 100 million a year. So what we have on the left-hand side is we have startups as well as established organizations uh, that are increasingly focused on identifying new needs in the marketplace and innovation. When they find a need in the marketplace, they inevitably want to put together a next generation product or service, or maybe build a new industry. And if we are building a product today, invariably it incorporates some form of technology. And then at the bottom, what we really care about is, while it's, it's easy for me to talk about the future, what we really care about isn't necessarily sort of what's coming, it's the impact that it will have on our daily lives, especially our businesses, our industries, our countries, and then it's when. So if we take self-driving cars as an, as an example, you can identify the need, you can build the world's best self-driving car, you can deliver it into the marketplace for free, but if the regulators say no, you won't change anything. It won't have an impact on any business because it's going to be shelfware. So I work with a lot of the regulators as well to help them speed up regulation. Um, so organizations like Ofgem, uh, Ofcom, Ofwat, the FDA, the FAA, the CAA, as well as uh, a variety of European regulators. Most regulators in the past would take about three years to get something through. We're starting to get to the point where regulators are teaming up with companies to get products and new services through in about six months. So we speed all of this stuff up. Over time, increasingly, we're going to be devolving more and more decision-making to the machines. We already see that. You know, if you went into a hotel and you took a lift up to, your, up to your hotel room, you're trusting that machine. You are trusting that lift to stop when you're going up and when you're going down. As we look at self-driving transportation, for example, you are trusting the car to brake. 
So increasingly, we are, making, we are emboldening machines with more and more trust. And this changes the equation. The other big benefit that, uh, that technology has on companies, um, which is one of the sort of underspoken ones, is technology drives the cost of individual transactions, whatever those transactions are, whether they're compute, whether they're storage, whether they're network, whether they're workforce, whether they're energy, either to zero or very close to zero. And we see that in the energy industry as well. From a business perspective, if I step back 20 years ago, and I asked you what impact you thought technology might have in your business or on your business, you might have looked at something like Moore's Law, or you might have looked at traditional computing technologies and said, well, next year we think that computer chips are going to be faster and cheaper. Therefore, we think that we can probably process more information than we do today, faster and cheaper than we do today. And if I asked you to extrapolate that out and say, well, what does that mean for your business? What, you know, what can you do with that? It's fairly easy. You can, it's just, it's, it's not too difficult. One of the problems that every industry on the planet has today is this. You don't just have one exponential technology coming at you, you have multiple. So as a business, even yourselves, your suppliers will be talking to you about, have you moved to the cloud? Have you digitized your business? And you're starting to go through that process now. But as you're going through that process, they will start saying, well, okay, have you have you had a conversation about blockchain? Have you had a conversation about artificial intelligence? And you'll be saying, well, we're starting to get a point of view on that. And then they'll start coming through and say, well, have you got a point of view on things like robotics? By the way, have you, have you played around with quantum computer algorithms? And, you know, particularly as they relate to, for example, energy brokerage. And you'll be saying, well, no, hang on. We've, we're just moving to cloud. We're just digitizing our business. We're playing with automation and AI and whatever it happens to be. All these things are piling up, and then they say, well, from a, from a B2C perspective, or even a B2B perspective, when you're looking at the performance of your individual plants, are you using virtual reality? Are you using augmented reality to help you understand the status, basically, of your operating environment? All these things are coming straight, you know, straight on top of each other. And so it sort of leaves organizations with a conundrum. Where do we start? What do we prioritize? And how do we build our technology stacks today and our business today so that we're future fit? However, you know, while organizations like Gartner, IDC, all these kinds of guys basically will typically talk to you about 10 to maybe sort of 15 uh, game-changing emerging technologies, we're now entering what I call the techno-Jurassic era. Now, what I mean by that is that there aren't 10 or 15 significant emerging technologies. There are 400. There's 170 on this radar. Every single one of these emerging technologies has an addressable market opportunity of half a trillion dollars. Every single one of these individual emerging technologies can change an industry almost overnight when they mature. And if you want to understand what's coming next, you combine these together. So for example, I talk about next generation smartphones. Well, advanced manufacturing. You can 3D print a smartphone, or as we start having a look at things like 4D printing, we'll come on to that a little, in a little bit. Uh, as you start moving further out, we're already starting to see the emergence of molecular assemblers. So at the start of this year, we took small molecule-sized robots, put them into a production line, and got them to make small molecular-sized products. So molecular assemblers are here, generation 0.1, but in terms of when does this stuff mature? When does this have an impact on my business? When can I use it? When is it commercially affordable, accessible, and all this sort of stuff? That's obviously still a way out. But from a 3D printing perspective, 3D printing is still relatively slow. So we have 3D holographic printing. If you want to make these chairs with a traditional 3D printer, it'll take you about six hours, and that's if I'm being kind. With a holographic printer, I can make one of these chairs every second. And that's here today. As we start having a look at biotechnology, you know, biotechnology, again, a lot of these technologies have an impact basically on other industries. If we have a look down here, there's gene editing. So gene editing here. Advances in gene editing in the, bio, in the biotechnology space has an impact on energy. 
because increasingly we are able to play with the DNA of whether it's plants or whether it's organic organisms to create everything from diesel basically to new, you know, to new uh, photovoltaic um, solar collectors. So recently, for example, in the energy sector, we use gene editing to create cyborg bacteria that can boost the efficiency of solar panels up to 32% from today's commercial perspective of kind of what, 15, 17%. Leading labs basically have PV, have PV going at about 26 to 28%. And then connectivity, you know, we start talking about 5G, but as we start putting 5G in, we're talking about 6G. Uh, we have biofuels coming through on the energy space. We have fusion, so here in Germany, you managed to get the, the, the star uh, fusion reactor going for a couple of minutes, which is a bit of a breakthrough. So fusion, as they always say, is still 25 years out. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, there's been some interesting improvements there. Uh, recently on the fusion side, we managed to create a self-healing fusion reactor. And we did that by combining it with some of these kind of what we call vascularized materials down here. Um, on the back of fusion, we now also have the possibility of things like quantum energy, graphene energy systems. Uh, if we have a look at uh, polymers on the energy side of things, nobody really cares about polymers. But if I go to an electric car company like BMW and I say, do you care about polymers? I'll say, no, we don't care about polymers. And if I take a polymer from the University of Bristol, I say, this polymer will let you charge your electric vehicle in three seconds to a charge of 450 miles. BMW are suddenly very, very interested. Uh, we also have wireless energy coming through. So for example, when we have a look at the future of transportation, we have lots of lithium ion batteries all over the place, but wireless energy starts creeping in. On the machine systems front, basically we have 3D chips, but we also have DNA computers we've created DNA computers. Uh, we've stored information in bacteria. We've replayed it from bacteria. We've turned bacteria into computing devices. And it's the same with chemical computing, liquid computers. You want to turn a bottle of water into a computing device. Last year, we created liquid transistors. So again, we're sort of, you know, so this is where, from a technology perspective, as we sort of go around this wheel, materials, self-healing materials, Security, we have hack-proof code, we have high assurance platforms, we have Morpheus computers. So a Morpheus computer is a computer that self-reconfigures its software and its hardware. It's like a Rubik's Cube. It's coming out of the US Department of Defense. They're impossible to hack. At the moment, nothing's ever impossible to hack, but you know, at the moment we can't. Sensor systems all over the place, so lots and lots of different types of sensors. We have quantum sensors that are coming through that make GPS irrelevant. Uh, and then from a user experience, because that's really what we care about, we have the traditional things, virtual reality, augmented reality. We have neural interfaces coming through as well. So it's not in this deck because of the time, but uh, by using sort of brain machine interfaces and artificial intelligence, we can read your thoughts. So we've been able to stream images and movies from people's heads in real time. So technology is a rocket ship. And where you actually think we are in terms of technology, we're all the way over there. So one of the things I want to do Wes, is over the next 10 years, basically, you're going to see these machines coming up more and more. And these will have an impact on your business, but also your customers' businesses. These are the creative machines. So I'm going to show you a little video. What if you could come up with thousands of options for a single design without drawing, all of which meet specific goals set by the designer? And from those options, pick the one design that delivers on the most important criteria, the design you couldn't possibly have imagined. This is generative design, a technology that harnesses massive computing power, creating forms with precise amounts of material only where needed achieving maximum performance while wasting nothing. The generative design can be about much more than simply turning out alternatives. Prototypes can be scanned and equipped with sensors that provide real-time performance data that can be looped back into the design process so the object, in effect, co-designs itself. And depending on the material and method of manufacturer chosen, the software can optimize the design for those choices. 
The things that have limited us in the past, software, materials, manufacturing, no longer do so. With generative design, the world can look and perform any way we want it to. This is the next stage in the evolution of design, and it's happening now. So this is where, say for example, I asked you to innovate a drone, something fairly basic. I took a drone, I said, innovate the drone. I would like it lighter, more reliable. I'd like it to use less energy. Yeah, as a human, but it would probably take you a while. You know, you sort of say, come back, yeah, Matt, come back in three months' time and I'll have a better drone for you. These generative adversarial networks are very, very good at innovating. They will take those drones, they will innovate them 10,000 times a second. So, but this is where we can combine this stuff together. So now what I do is I take a wireframe of a drone, for example, put it into a computer, and I now ask the computer and say, computer, make me a drone that is stronger, more reliable, and uses less energy. And it will go off, and it's an AI, it would look at all the data sources that it has access to, just like that one there, and it will come together and say, is this what you wanted? And by the way, those aren't gimmicks. Airbus are using them to design aircraft, under Armour are using them to design trainers, and then you 3D print the trainers off. And we have another little thing here coming up as well. Um, so today, these creative machines are sort of good at iterative innovation in hardware. You know, take a hardware product like a chair, get them to iterate that, they're fine with that, they can do it. Um, but over time, we're gonna have more computer power, we're going to have better artificial intelligence, we're going to have new materials, and we're going to have new advanced manufacturing techniques. And when we do that, we can start doing new things. So, how many of your children are in school at the moment? They probably should be. Some of them are probably being taught robotics because robotics is a future job, robotics engineer. This is from the University of Oslo. It is the world's first self-evolving robot. The robot is tasked with getting from one side of the room to the other as quickly as possible, and we have sensors in the robot. Those sensors are feeding information back to a generative adversarial network, a creative AI. It knows what it's supposed to do, so make the robot go from one side of the room to the other faster. It, it, it innovates new designs. And off the robot goes again. But once the, once the AI has created a sort of robot version number two, and so on and so forth, it sends the information to a 3D printer. It's printed off, it's assembled by a highly paid lab technician called Brian. He assembles it and then he puts it back on the floor to run. However, and we did this two years ago, if you replace that 3D printer with a 4D printer, the robot walks off the printer itself. So the reason why I'm showing you these basically is to demonstrate that the rate of innovation is going to accelerate. I had conversations recently with Henkel. These AIs are also being used in organic chemistry. They're being used in synthetic biology. What happens basically when the products that you use or the products that your competitors create or your customers create are innovated 10,000 times faster than they are today? But stepping on from that, we now have AIs that are self-evolving, self-designing, self-replicating, and self-coding. So if you want to go and have a look at an example of a codeless AI, Google have AutoML. Uh, if you want to go and have a look at an example of a self-coding, self-programming robot, Microsoft Deep Coder is the platform for you. So this is where you speak to a computer and you say, build me an application or build me an AI that does whatever it happens to be. It will go off, on the one hand, it will go off and scavenge sort of GitHub, Stack Overflow, and it'll pull together code, compile it and say, is that the program that you wanted? but it's only five lines of code, generation one, generation 0.1 at the moment. But again, remember, this stuff gets better, faster, quicker, and then you stick this stuff into the internet and suddenly everyone's designing applications. Now, 
the same machines, basically these same machines, are able to start innovating creative machines. So what happens when you start getting a truly creative artificial intelligence that isn't just good at iterating the next chair or a hardware product, but can, is now very, very good at making enterprise software? This is all within the scope of 2030 as well, by the way. These things exist today. They will get better this year, next year, the year after, and everything else. You shove them into the internet. You take your credit card or crypto wallet of choice. Go to Google. Go to Microsoft Azure's platform. You now have access to a creative AI as a startup or as an entrepreneur. Now you can go off and build whatever it is you want to build. So suddenly, the pace of change accelerates. The amount of competition in the marketplace accelerates, and so on. However, as we start having a look at sort of the future of living, um, per se, basically, in 2030, the way that we interact with computers, basically, is going to change. Have you noticed that more and more organizations are trying to get you to talk to computers today? You know, how many of you have keyboards in your car? You know? um, so increasingly, we're going to be talking to computers. This is obviously Alexa. This is a fantastic disintermediation play from Amazon. It's not just a conversational in interface. They're developing those. That'll come out next year. These are disintermediation plays. Alexa, switch my energy provider from A to B. Alexa, uh, order milk. But it doesn't order it from Caro 4. It orders it from Amazon. It's a disintermediation play. Google, a little while ago, uh, democratized access to information. So for example, if I asked you what the, what the melting point or what the, what the freezing point rather of nitrogen dioxide is today, it'll take you five seconds to find out. Democratization of information. Where we are going now is we are democratizing access to expertise. So for example, we're starting with lawyers as well as lots of others. If you want to have access to an artificially intelligent robo-lawyer, as they're called, then we have Law Geeks, we have Ross Intelligence, which is backed up by IBM Watson and so forth. Increasingly, you'll be able to ask the computer for something. Can you put me together an NDA contract? Can you do something? You know, how do I make nitrogen dioxide or whatever it happens to be? So artificial intelligence in the cloud combined with some clever innovations are helping us democratize access to expertise. So what does that do for skills? Also, over the next 10 years, we're going to see more, more advancements and improvements in augmented reality and virtual reality. I still don't think virtual reality is really going to come through in the consumer environment too much because you've got to strap on a headset. So this is where we have things like cultural adoption. Just because I have the technology to put you into an immersive world doesn't mean that you're all going to sit there with headsets on. It's a cultural thing. Um, so augmented reality. However, again, as we start moving further and further into the future, uh, again, we see this today. Emerging technologies today, as soon as you put them into any form of cloud product or digital product, the effect that they have is they allow you to democratize access, they allow you to democratize uh, access to services and they decentralize those services. So I'll give you a very, very quick example. Um, what am I doing? I'm checking my heart to see whether or not, but see, I'm at risk of having a heart attack. Yeah. What am I doing now? These exist, by the way. Um, it looks like I'm, yeah, for example, I might be taking a selfie. I'm checking myself for pancreatic cancer using the camera and an artificial intelligence, especially on the phone. I'm democratizing healthcare with the Max Planck Institute, and I'm decentralizing it. I put that app into a mobile phone, basically in Africa, and all of a sudden, 300 million people have access to basic primary care. I'm checking myself for skin cancer. I'm checking myself for the onset of early dementia and Alzheimer's. I'm also checking myself to see if I have any diseases, which I don't, by the way. They're certainly not contagious, nothing to worry about. So these technologies decentralize industries like crazy. Think about the energy industry, think about blockchain, decentralization, moving away from centralized power generation through to virtual power plants, for example. Doesn't matter what industry it is. In addition to that, death of privacy. We're all used to being spied on online. But increasingly, you'll be spied on offline. Um, and we'll sort of come on to that. So if you think that you have no online privacy, increasingly, you will have no offline privacy. We can use the Wi-Fi in here to do a whole variety of interesting things. I'll come on to that in a bit. So 
in the future privacy as a service? Uh, now, in addition to that, um, and I'm just putting this in here just so we talk about it, the more information that you collect on your users, on your products, on your organization, the more insights you can gather. We know that. The more personalized the services can become. However, from an individual user's perspective, if you don't like these large organizations sucking up your information and controlling your information, how many of you would like to take back control of your personal information? No. And if I asked you, how many of you, if I, gave, if I said to you, right, I've got a million dollars here, I will give a million dollars to the first person who can delete all of the information that's held about them from the internet, how many of you are going to be able to pick up that million dollars? You have completely lost control of your information. So this is why we're now starting to see a revolution come through, uh, both in the multinational arena, but also with Sir Tim Berners-Lee, so founder of the internet, these kinds of things, sovereign ID systems. They're based on blockchain. You go onto a sovereign ID platform, you put your information in there, then you can see who's used it, you can give people access to it, you can rescind access. These technologies are now being baked into internet version two. Uh, similarly, at work, the world of work is changing. Over in Hong Kong, we've seen the emergence of the world's first fully autonomous organizations. It's a hedge fund called IDA. It has no people. Um, if you take this same model and you apply it to Uber, particularly if you're in a transaction-based business, there are lots and lots more organizations that can be automated in this way. Insurance basically is a kind of model on this particular one. So the rise of autonomous organizations are here today. But again, as we start heading out to 2030, they won't be everywhere but there will be a lot more of them. Uh, similarly, um, one, of the, one of the biggest challenges that we actually have as people is you know, every, almost every piece of press that we read basically is the rise of artificial intelligence and automation. You know, if you have a look at a lot of the academic research, they say that 50% of us will be out of jobs because we'll all be automated in 10 to 20 years. And while I don't necessarily believe that, we are now having to literally rethink basically how we manage our careers throughout our lifetimes. You know, my kids are sort of four and six. They're going through this now. You know, I go and have a conversation basically with a headmaster of a, of a company and I say, what do you, you know, and I say to them, what jobs could they do when they're older? And they go, lawyer. I work with Dentons, the world's largest law firm. We're automating lawyers today, not in sort of 20 years time. So we need to rethink basically how we train our workforce. We need to think about the internal culture of an organization. So for example, workforce mobility within an organization. If you're an engineer in one part of the organization, should we start moving you around to give you sort of different experiences in the other part of the organization? And when we talk about retraining the workforce of the future, how do you take somebody who is in a dead ending job and move them to a new job, either in a new industry or a new company? We know how to do that. You can use platforms like Coursera, edX, Udacity, and everything else, and I do this with governments. But the trick is doing it at speed. We haven't got three or four years to send you back to university and college to relearn everything. And increasingly, we've been able to demonstrate that you can learn the foundations of a new job within about 20 hours. And that's the foundations. Doesn't that mean you're an expert? But we now start rethinking education. In terms of soft skills, these are the soft skills that are going to sort of make you future fit. Adaptability, basically from a personal perspective, is the key one, but also things like entrepreneurship, exponential thinking. Morality is in there again, because all of these exponential technologies are very, very powerful, but they can do very great good, they can do good things, but they can also do some quite nasty things as well. Storytelling, leadership, ethics, empathy. Um, we used to live our lives kind of local, you know, so local and linear. What affected us used to sort of be around, you know, within 20 miles of ourselves. Now something can happen on the other side of the planet and it can have an effect on us. So we're increasingly going global and exponential. Similarly, one of the things we talk about when we're having a look at the future of education and training is the death of specialisms. If you're, for example, a bankruptcy lawyer, today we're automating bankruptcy lawyers. You are a specialist. So now, basically, do we now help you sort of move into other areas, environmental law, corporate law, whatever it happens to be? So increasingly, we're talking about the death of specialisms, which again plays into adaptable workforces, all that kind of stuff. When we have a look at home, no surprises here, connected home. 
Most of you have probably already got some form of connected home device. Connected home devices change not just basically how, yeah, not, you know, don't just change things like energy consumption, but there's lots and lots of different things we can do. So I'm going to kind of presume that you know a lot about connected home anyway. Um, but what you might not know is that increasingly we're able to use your Wi-Fi routers to figure out how you're feeling, your emotions, your health, and all sorts of other things, let alone your behaviors. So I talked about the Wi-Fi in this room. These Wi-Fi routers, these are standard Wi-Fi routers with a bit of artificial intelligence baked within them. All we do is we use, the, we use feedback from the electromagnetic spectrum and we can under, uh, suddenly understand how you're walking, your heart rates, your emotions and your moods. So what does that do for privacy, but also what does that do for things like assistive care? So if you think that the only spy in your home is the Alexa camera or your smart TV or whatever it happens to be, look out for these guys. Um, similarly, urban agriculture. Um, so throughout Europe, but also throughout the Middle East, as well as lots of other places, we're increasingly growing food within a city. Vertical farms, all these kinds of things. Um, similarly, we're now at the point where we can grow meat in bioreactors. So today, if, you go, if I ask you to go and buy some steak, for example, you'll go down to the local Carrefour, you'll buy a piece of steak. Over in China, over in Israel, over in the Middle East, over in the US, this has just been approved by the FDA for sale in Walmart. You can take stem cells from an animal, a cow, a chicken, duck, turkey, whatever it happens to be, put it into a bioreactor, and you can grow your own meat. But it's not artificial meat, it's not synthetic meat. It's the real deal. So again, we are changing the face of agriculture. If you use these types of technologies, for example, I was presenting to the CEO of McDonald's a couple of weeks ago. If you use these technologies, you collapse McDonald's entire global food supply chain. Same with Carrefour. Carrefour are starting to use some of these things. They'll grow the uh, vegetables, especially in vertical farms, on the roofs or wherever they're doing it. Um, from an energy perspective, again, this is your sort of home turf here. I'm not going to, tell you, I'm not going to sort of dabble on this too much. Um, but increasingly, you know, we're starting to see the emergence of autonomous energy grids over in the US. What impact does an autonomous energy grid have on Europe? From a regulator perspective, when I have a conversation with the regulators and say, how would you manage an autonomous energy grid? They have no idea. Um, and on the topic of regulators, when we have a look at sort of regulators like the FCA in the UK and, off, and Ofgem, we're now starting to talk about robo-regulators. So these are automated regulators. And we're putting together the proof of concepts there. So by 2030, we'll have the first robo-regulator. And in fact, Japan's already sort of ahead, basically, in the game in the financial services sector on that front. Um, similarly, when we have a look at blockchain distributed energy grids, when we have a look at the impact of renewables, basically, on the energy mix, and so on and so forth, um, energy is being revolutionized. So for example, over in the Middle East, we're building out a six gigawatt solar, factory, a solar farm. Um, the unsubsidized cost of energy basically in that solar farm is 2.63 cents per kilowatt hour. So when we talk about the cost of energy starting to drive down, maybe not to zero, but if I gave you a solar panel, if I installed it free of charge and it was reliable and never needed maintenance, could you disconnect yourselves from the grid? Because they are in Japan. And that's before we talk about virtual power plants and aggregating all this sort of stuff together. Entertainment. Uh, increasingly, I mean, I have a video, but again, um, it's in another, another deck. Yeah. If you have children, basically, that want to be pop stars, we now have these same generative artificial intelligences that are designing their own music, designing their own art. Uh, they are building all sorts of things. If you have children, for example, who say, I want to be a virtual blogger, increasingly, we have uh, avatars like Lil Michaela. Uh, who will now sell products on behalf of Prada and Diesel and everything else. She's not real. She's a high-definition avatar. And Prada and the fashion houses will simply say, we want a high-definition avatar that looks like this, sort of da-da-da, um, and then we want to put, uh, put our clothes on her. Um, Sony just signed this pop star. So this is an artificial intelligence. Uh, this is a lady called Taryn. All of her songs are written by an artificial intelligence called Ampner. She has 452,000 YouTube subscribers. 
She's had over half a billion views, and Sony have signed her. So artificial intelligence is starting to make waves in a whole variety of different entertainment sectors. Netflix, for example, are in increasingly playing around with new entertainment methods that let you dictate the end of, the end of a film. It can you know, the smart TV detects your mood, detects that you're a bit like that, bored of whatever it is you're watching. It uses big data to understand what your preferences are, and, 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 and it starts creating a new ending. Healthcare, as I've already sort of alluded to, the number of things that we can do in healthcare basically are staggering. So last year, we took a man in the UK with Huntington syndrome, uh, and we used an in vivo gene editing technique. So Hunt Huntington syndrome will kill you by the age of 20 painfully. It's inherit an inherited genetic disease. What we did is we used an in vivo gene editing technology called CRISPR, edited it right out of him. He no longer has it. From an insurance perspective, for example, as well, you know, if you are paralyzed in a car crash, and I hope it doesn't happen, say, for example, in the next 10 years, we've already cured paralysis. So we use carbon nanotubes, and we can use a whole variety of different things, but paralysis is no longer for life. There is a lot happening in the bio sector. In the retail sector, Amazon in 2019 basically will become the world's first fully autonomous retailer. So you know I talked about creative AIs? Amazon have created a creative AI that designs clothes. If you want to order a shirt, for example, uh, what this creative AI will do is it will go out, it will have a look at all the top rated shirts on Snapchat, Facebook, all those kinds of things, and it will just iterate. It'll create a wireframe, it'll iterate it, and then it might just put a little red fleck in it. It then puts that onto Amazon's website. You go and have a look at it on Amazon's website. There's a little camera basically somewhere in your home. You try it on, you know, virtually. So you're looking basically at the screen. You try a virtual fitting room. You try it on. In the camera, there's a body sensing device as well. It's taking your measurements basically while you're looking at the machine. So now it's creating the perfectly tailored shirt for you. You like it, you buy it. That shirt didn't exist. All that Amazon have in tw starting 2019 is just loads of fabric. It, you know, these on-demand machines, on-demand manufacturing machines, take this fabric, make your shirt, put it into a box, a robot picker, because we now have better robot pickers because we have better artificial intelligence, better machine vision, and better robotic systems, so these things are faster than the human warehouse pickers, picks it, puts it into an autonomous vehicle, whatever that is, whether it's a drone, a van, a truck, car, whatever you like, delivers it to your home. World's first fully autonomous retailer. So from a retail perspective, retailers think that they've already been disrupted with e-commerce. And I was in South Africa last week talking to a bunch of retailers um, about the rise of this. We can 3D print some fantastic clothes right now. There's a, couple of, there's a lady in Miami that's doing some fantastic stuff. So retail is about to be disrupted again because we are now producing products on demand, whether it's in stores, we're getting rid of inventory, and, and, and. Um, however, you know, as we start having a look at the future of mobility, uh, I always tend to sort of think that the future of transport is relatively easy. Um, firstly, it's increasingly going to be on demand. Order it with your smartphone app. Increasingly, everything is, all the operators are going to go. So whether, it's, whether you're a truck driver, whether you're in an aircraft, whether you're in a cargo ship, whether you're in a van, whether you're in a car, increasingly, everything is going driverless. Uh, for example, Rolls-Royce, we're now put assembling 250,000 ton fully autonomous cargo ships. A fully autonomous cargo ship has the reduces the operating cost, its operating cost by about 20 to 30 percent by doing that. So take the drivers out. Increasingly, obviously, we're electrifying the transportation industry. Personally, I think that electricity is going to win out over hydrogen. When you have a look at the investment patterns, when you have a look at the research and development, when you have a look at where the manufacturers are placing their bets, when you have a look at the new cars and products that are coming through, when you have a look at the energy grids, um, when you have a look at things like the supercharger networks, let alone before you start baking in some new fancy um, sort of energy generation technologies, electric winds. I don't really see hydrogen sort of coming back, uh, or certainly not in the mobility space. Um, however, you know, doing a little bit of a deeper dive, you, know, you all, all know, but if I stand up here and talk to you about electric vehicles, because you all know about electric vehicles, because this is kind of your backyard, we're already developing platforms that are batteryless. So today we have a combustion engine vehicle. Different, different governments around Europe will ban the sale of combustion 
based vehicles in 2030, 2040. We moved to hybrid, we moved to full electric vehicles with lithium ion batteries. Then we start moving to wireless charging. BMW already bringing out wirelessly charged cars, albeit small ones. Then we start bringing out new materials. So this is a Lamborghini. This is the Terzo Millenio. Um, this is the world's, hopefully, the world's first batteryless hypercar. So over time, and again, these technologies are now emerging today, but they will be in production by 2030. Increasingly, we can turn the chairs that you're sitting on. They're called structural batteries. We can take carbon fiber, we can take composites, we can take cotton and a whole variety of different materials, and we can electrify them. We could electrify the chairs. The chairs, for example, can, be can become electricity generation and storage devices. And then we bake those basically into a vehicle. So batteryless cars. Now, if you're a government who's planning to spend lots of billions basically on the next generation supercharger network, where every car plugs in, if we are already starting to see the emergence of wirelessly charged cars, do you now change the style of your supercharger network? And if your supercharger network is expected to have a shelf life of 10 to 20 years, as we start heading towards batteryless vehicles, how does that affect your strategy your, and your investment today? And then in addition to that, have you actually thought about how many of you drive a car? Loads of you. Um, have you ever thought basically that your cars are dying? The car as a format is dying? Because if I take away the brake pedals, if I take away the steering wheel, if I take away the dashboard, are you in a car or are you in a pod? So Toyota, Audi, this is the Audi Long Distance Lounge. Um, it's not lost on the car manufacturers that the car is actually dying. And what we have is we have a pod. And pods are blank canvases. So this is a Toyota e-palette. This is a bit horrible, but hey-ho. Um, but if you have a pod and you have a sensible way to configure them, this can be a shop. This can be a mobile office. This could be an entertainment lounge, basically for you and your family when you're going on long distance journeys. But similarly, when we start talking about new form factors and we start talking about multimodal transportation, one of the things that we talk about and actually we've invested in in the UAE is you could get into this pod. So for example, if you wanted to travel to, let's say for example, you wanted to travel to Marseille, from a consumer perspective, you could take lots of different types of transport. Or you could get in this pod out, outside. This pod could then go to a train station, load itself up on a train, shoot you down to Marseille, come off the other end. So we're going to go from multimodal to, uh, I say unimodal, but uh, this is where you know, transportation is being reinvented in all sorts of different places. By 2030, we'll have more of these things coming through. So for example, again, in Dubai, um, we've just tested the world's first flying taxi network. We're now doing the same in Singapore. Uber have run competitions along with Airbus for next generation designs for uh, sky taxi stations. So while this won't be anywhere near mainstream in 2030, and I'm not gonna pretend that it is, it's likely that if you live in a large urban center, you might be able to hop onto one of these things um, just using your smartphone app. But there won't be lots of them, because again, this stuff takes time to come through. So while I'm a futurist, I'm not going to be one of those that says, these will be, you know, we'll all be traveling by sky taxis in three years' time. However, when we start having a look at continental travel, basically, would you want to take a train to China? We have Hyperloops coming through. Uh, these are already starting, we're starting to take orders for the first networks of these, again, in the Middle East, but also across Russia and Europe uh, and the US. These things travel at 700 miles an hour. Think train in a vacuum tube. However, in China, we now already see the emergence of 2,500 mile an hour trains. So if you're an airline company and you're now starting to compete with a train that goes 2,500 miles an hour, bearing in mind that the cost of the tickets for these things will be about 30 euro, that's where we're going because it's basically a train. Um, these things levitate as well. What makes a two and a half thousand mile an hour train possible is advances in mega magnets. Lots of different technologies come together, different composites, all that kind of stuff. However, if we really want to sort of stir things up, and this is the, I'll leave you with this little thought. 
Um, what's coming next? Basically, the, we've already test flight. We've already tested it 70 times out in Cape Canaveral. Um, you all have probably seen it already. Uh, it's coming 2023-2024. The FAA over in the US are approving the first flights. And the first flight of one of these basically is going to be in 2019. But it's going to be into sort of more traditional sector. It's going to be going to the ISS first. So by 2030, the people who are building these have already got the investment. They've already got the regulators behind them. They're already proving the tech. This is SpaceX. We've talked about a lot of things. We've talked about accelerating innovation. We've talked about lots of different emerging technologies. We've talked about uh, batteryless hypercars and all kinds of things. And uh, that's it from me. So thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you very much. I can imagine that you might have some questions for Matthew. Oh, hello. <laughs> Hi, Matthew. Um, fascinating presentation. Thank you. We are electricity generators. On your radar screen, you mentioned quarks, energy systems, molecular energy systems. Could you elaborate a little bit more what it means, in particular for the daily use, how decentral it is, whether it's replacing batteries, or what would it mean? Yeah, so at the moment, so quark, thank you. Um, so quark energy basically is a theoretical energy. Um, CERN, about five to six months ago, discovered the existence of um, a new type of matter. And they, what they discovered is they discovered that if they actually crash quarks together, uh, what you have is you have a potential, so theoretical, and new energy system that has, it has the potential to deliver at least eight times more power than fusion when fusion comes online. So quark basically is still theoretical. No one's actually working on it yet because it's still trying to sort fusion out. Um, from, a from a molecular perspective, um, one of the things basically I, I sort of didn't cover in there is from a healthcare perspective, we're actually, generate, we're actually producing a variety of different nanobots and nanomachines that go into the blood. Um, so for example, one of the little nanomachines basically that's been produced by Max Planck Institute is, uh, it's, a little, it's got a little enzyme engine. So when we talk about molecular energy, um, there's a variety, we're literally talking about deriving energy from individual molecules at a very, very small scale to power small things. Because whether it's things like biological or DNA-based computers, uh, we need to be able to power those somehow. And you can't just take a lithium-ion battery. Um, to give you an example, uh, we did a test basically with the University of Manchester a little while ago. If that was a biological computer, bearing in mind that we've already created some biological computers, if this cup was about a tenth of the way full, I could cram, I could cram a biological computer into here that has more 
computing power than every single computer on the planet today. So, but for these types of systems, we need a different way to power an energy, yeah, to power them. Um, for little nanobots, what we can do, so going back to this little, this little nano machine, this little nano machine will go around in your bloodstream and it will detect, it's got a biomarker in it. These biomarkers will detect the presence of particular DNA fragments. So in this case, one of these machines will detect a DNA fragment called CT3A. If it detects the presence of CT3A, you have cancer somewhere in your body. So these little nano machines are able to tell you one to two to three years ahead of time that you have cancer at a very, very small scale before it really becomes a problem. Now, you, these little machines basically can communicate back to a smartphone, that can communicate back to a doctor. You go to your doctor and you say, look, my little nano machine has picked up a cancerous biomarker and the doctor can say, well, fortunately we've caught it early. So when we start, having, as I say, when we start having a look at biological computers, which increasingly will be used in biofabrication and biomanufacturing, um, also in the technology space. So, for example, if we have a conversation about biological computers again, if you take the US DOD at the moment uh, are, have a program called the Molecular Information Systems Program. Taking, for example, a Google data center, a Google data center is a huge hyperscale data center. They cost billions to stand up and they cost billions to run. If we use biological DNA-based computers, we've also created DNA artificial intelligence, but we also use these molecular information systems which are made out of polymers, so you can think of these as polymer-based computers. What I can do is I can take a hyperscale data center that will easily fill this whole site. And I can collapse it into something that's half the size of this table. So exascale processing, exascale storage in something that's half the size of this stand. So that's what we need things like uh, molecular energy systems for. So they're sort of, uh, there's a whole variety of different things we can use them for, but those are the main ones they're being lined up for at the moment. I think, Henrik, you had a question? I was wondering how your model of accelerating disruption will work economically, because in the end it might mean that you are never able to earn back your, on your investments, and at a certain point in time it stops, because nobody is going to invest anymore, right? So what incentives, what frameworks do you need to make that work? Uh, so good question. So I work with around 400 different investors across private equity, venture capital, basically, as well as institutional investors and pension funds. And that's one of the problems they see. So, for example, even if you just take artificial intelligence and we say, if we take a traditional, in, a traditional company and we embed it with artificial intelligence, so all of a sudden, does that mean that that organization can run more efficiently and or can it enter new markets swiftly or whatever? Can it identify a new market that you can move into? And that's before we get into software development and DevOps and all that sort of stuff. Um, so typically what I'm finding with a lot of the institutional investors, basically they are, they're trying to see beyond the curve. Um, they're still very focused on artificial intelligence and some of the more sort of traditional things. But a lot of the community are now starting to make, small, you know, make relatively smaller bets in smaller companies. So rather than taking you know, $100 million and investing it in one big company, they're taking that $100 million, splitting it into a million, basically, and then putting it into 100 smaller companies. So the fear of disruption is haunting a lot of the investors because they're see, they are starting to see how fast things can change. Yeah, they're also starting to see how quickly an industry incumbent go, can go from being the king of its hill to suddenly being in second, third place, or even just made redundant. I mean, if we have a look at you know, Uber with the, uh, the taxi medallions, a taxi medallion used to be worth a million dollars. So people used to, you know, individuals used to buy those as an investment. Uber came along, you can't give away a taxi medallion any longer. Um, and that's before we sort of get to the institutional guys. But it's, yeah, so smaller investments. Technology, do you also have a view what that does to us as mankind, as a society? So any thoughts on nations, democracy, what yeah. kind of war can we expect? Yeah, uh, good, <laughs> good and slightly scary question. Um, so increasingly what we see basically is with all of these emerging technologies, we've got three superpowers ostensibly at the moment, you know, in the US, Russia and China. What those guys do is those guys basically are very, you know, are very, very heavily involved in building out massive 
aircraft carriers. So, you know, they will drop $25 billion building an aircraft carrier and everything else. Meanwhile, you have you know, countries like Israel, basically, they're specializing in cyber because you can take out an aircraft carrier basically using a cyber attack in a whole variety of different ways. Um, so when we start having a look at security, for example, security um, and the emergence of war, increasingly, more and more individuals have access to increasingly powerful technologies. Um, giving you an example, for $100, basically, you can, in, the, in the US, you can go and buy yourself a CRISPR kit. And CRISPR kit is a gene editing kit. It's 100 bucks. I suppose you've all got 100 bucks, right? Um, I go and buy my CRISPR kit. I go on to a variety of online gene databases, and I can recreate the horsepox virus. And that was done recently by a university. If I can recreate the horsepox virus, it's not very long before I can re literally bring smallpox back to life. So while you have all of these, you know, while you have the world's superpowers very busy at the top end, investing in tanks, aircraft, aircraft carriers, hypersonic missiles, laser systems, satellite, you know, satellite defeat systems, um, terrorists are getting more powerful because they have more access than ever before to increasingly powerful technologies. Drone plus machine vision plus hand grenade. You know. um, however, basically, in terms of society, there's a lot of talk about automation. Um, and you know, as humans, basically, we're very, very good at looking at the downsides. In that radar that I showed you, we kind of, we're starting to have the technologies now to help us live way beyond 100 years. You have a heart attack today, you need to wait for a heart transplant from somebody who's compatible. We're already starting to 3D print hearts. So for, you, for example, in the same scenario, in 10 years' time, you have a heart attack, I take some stem, pluripotent stem cells from you at the hospital, I put them into a bio, bio printer, and I can 3D print a new heart for you. However, from a human perspective, um, on the physical side, if I'm 3D printing you a new heart, why can't I 3D print sensors and electronics into it? Now why can't I give you a bionic heart that self-regulates? So if you're starting to have a heart attack, it moderates itself, it tells me, all that kind of stuff. Um, in terms of automation, again, um, we all have it basically within ourselves to learn new things. I work basically with a, a foundation down in South Africa called Crystal, Founda Crystal House Foundation. What we do basically is we take about 45,000 students basically over the past number of years and we put them into a school system and these kids come out in the top 5% of, in the top 5 of their countries for grades. But the point I make with Crystal House is the entry criteria is that you have no money, you live in a slum with open sewers, your family basically are typically either abusive and or drug addicts. So what we're able to do is we can take people who have absolutely no future, put them into the right education and training environment, provide them with the right resources, and these guys are working at NASA and Boeing and everything else now. So we all have a huge amount of potential within us to, to change. But in addition to that, you know, as particular um, jobs dead end, about three years ago, we managed to upload knowledge to people's brains. So what we did is we took, and this was with DARPA, uh, we took 35 Top Gun pilots, uh, and we put them into an F-35 simulator. We took the F-35 simulators up to 35,000 feet, and we put brain skull caps onto these pilots. We then put the F-35s into flat spins, and we told the pilots to land the aircraft. So they all landed these aircraft. Flat spins very, very hard to get out of. We then took 35 volunteers who'd never been in an aircraft before, put them into the same simulator, put the skull caps on, and replayed the brain waves to them. Took the F-35s up to 35,000 feet, put them into a flat spin, and 60% of the people landed the aircraft. The 40% of the people who didn't land these aircraft didn't have the necessary sort of motor skills, basically, to land them. The critics at the time basically said, well, that's all very well and good, but the, so you've uploaded knowledge to people's brains, and there are now big programs, as you can imagine, going on around this, because the your human brain is plastic. And they said, yeah, but the effect only lasted half an hour. And the researchers at the time said, you kind of missed the point. We've uploaded knowledge. So this is sort of where, not necessarily 2030, but as we start pushing the boundaries to 2050, do you really just think that you are only going to be human?
do you really think that things like these smart watches are just going to be on us? Yeah, eventually, the technology goes inside us. Um, increasingly, basically, we are augmenting ourselves. So, for example, when people talk about AI, we also talk about it in terms of augmented intelligence. Um, what happens, basically, say, for example, if you were doing a particular job today and you wanted to learn a new job, what happens in the time when expertise is democratized and you say to a computer, teach me how to become a data scientist? Teach me how to become a synthetic biologist. And it pulls together all the course materials, uses avatars to teach you. And again, we're doing this in the Middle East. We already have avatars teaching people. Um, what happens, basically, at that point um, to your skills? Suddenly, does that mean that you can flip from this job to the other? So it's not necessarily, from when we talk about automation and the risk of us all being made redundant, I can be made redundant like most of them. Um, it's not that we don't have the potential to do something else. It's the fact that in a lot of cases, a lot of the governments haven't laid out the right frameworks, the right journeys, or the right plans. We now have those frameworks, and we're now implementing them across a variety of different countries. Do you have any recommendations for us as being leader? What can we do? What kind of skills are required that we can actually tackle those challenges? Yeah. Um, so, so starting today. Yeah, starting today. Yeah. It's no, absolutely. a long period. Um, <laughs> So fortunately, basically, a lot of the things I've sort of shown you here, basically, a lot of them, you know, we've got some of the things that are in the labs, um, and we've got some things that are now starting to be commercialized and coming out into the market, you know, electric cars and all that kind of stuff, virtual power plants. Um, I would encourage you on the, so firstly, get outside of your comfort zones, get outside of your industry, because a lot of the new things, basically, that affect individual industries don't come from within that individual industry. Um, Creative, you know, when we talk about creative AIs, basically, if you take a creative AI, you shove it into an electric BMW, we've already demonstrated it. You can, say, you can reduce the power consumption of that BMW by between 20 to 40%. Yeah. Um, so get outside of your comfort zones. Realize, basically, that technology is a rocket ship. Have conversations with startups and incubators. Go and have conversations with other communities around the world as well, because while there's a huge amount of innovation in Germany, there's a lot in Singapore, there's a lot in London, there's a lot in Paris, there's a lot in the US, there's a lot coming out of China. Um, and go out and have a look, and then bring it, back to, bring it back home. And then this is sort of where you come, you bring it back home, and you say, we've seen all these things, and you lay it down in a, almost a sort of what if. You know, we saw this, we think this could have a big impact on our business, yes or no, whether it's a threat or an opportunity. Could it help us reduce costs or move into a new market? Um, and you just grade it all. The other thing that I would encourage you to do is when I have conversations basically with uh, people in the energy sector, the retail sector, financial services sector, and I say, what industry are you in? If I asked you guys, what industry are you in? They don't know anymore. I know. <laughs> Looks so like you. it. Right. <laughs> Arguably, yeah. <laughs> Arguably. They're all shocked now. Yeah. Arguably, you're in, the, you're in the energy industry. If I go and ask the, the car manufacturers and say, what industry are you in? They will say transportation. I go and ask Luft, Lufthansa. They will say, we are in the airline industry. I ask Deutsche Bank. They will say, we're in the financial services industry. Okay? I go and have that same conversation basically with a technology company, whether it's Baidu, whether it's Alibaba, whether it's Google, whoever it happens to be, and I say to them, what industry are you in? And they say, all of them. So this is where increasingly, you know, from, from, a, from an industry perspective, we think we are in one industry and we think we are constrained to that industry. But all of these technologies, let alone when you start talking digitization, um, all of these technologies are blurring the lines between every single industry. They're breaking down the borders between every single industry. So today, yes, you are in the energy industry, but why couldn't you be in the payments industry? Why couldn't you be providing mobility as a service? Why couldn't you be, yeah, you could be in almost any industry that you want. And then it, case, then it comes down to, well, okay, how do we move into it? What do we need? What's the execution and go to market strategy and all that sort of stuff. Reframing your business in today's world is one of the best things that you can do because when you reframe your business, you invest in resources differently, you make different choices. Because from an energy perspective, yeah, so for example, with Centrica, Centrica have just sold off all their energy generation assets. 
Um, but um, yeah, increasingly, are you in one industry or are you in them all? So reframing. Any one of you a very urgent question? Otherwise, looking at the time, I can just say it was a lot of information, a lot of food for thoughts for us. Thank you very much, Matthew. Thank you.